A big controversy in downtown Providence. Well, the dynamic changes. We'll talk about it tonight. Good evening. Welcome to my state of mind. I am Dan York. It's an honor to have you aboard, baby. It is cold outside. How can we not start the program discussing that? Ken Block is my guest today, not for a typical political visit, but even candidates can create substantial conversation. <laughs> That's a funny way to put it, Dan. But really, sometimes candidates, you know why I say that? Because sometimes we think, oh, he's a candidate. He's just, you know, mouthing off or she's just mouthing off. But I think Ken Block has done something provocative today. The former moderate party candidate, moderate party creator, chairman, now turned Republican. Uh, he had a press conference today off this story that we discussed at length last night where uh, Angus Davis, one of the business people downtown, had been protesting the state's decision to move a probation and parole office into downtown Providence. Since our broadcast last night, that decision has been revisited by the Chafee administration. And I'll put all that stuff in perspective for you as we go. But Ken is my guest, and I will leave as much time as I possibly can for him today because there's a lot to this story. So let me go to an abbreviated rundown. Yes, we certainly are. I wrote that while I was distracted. Is that okay? Can I write that on television? Okay, that's fine. I just want to check in and make sure I'm being polite. Uh, this is the first day the General Assembly is actually doing some business and I've got a funny reflection on it. Maybe not purposely meant to be funny, um, but it is funny nonetheless. And on the themes that come out of the General Assembly, there seems to be some pretty serious conversation about poverty. I have a reflection on that for you this evening. And wow, did you watch that game last night? With a minute 19 to go, the whole story blew up for Auburn. Let's get into it. This has been just so cold. Now, you'd think I'd have some, you know, incredible thing to say about this, but I'm just chattering like you are, meaning my teeth. But we do have some funny video. Do we have headlines on this? I think we do, yes. The USA Today, Beyond Cold. I didn't know, I asked Jess before we got on tonight, can we use that word? If, I guess if the USA Today, used to be you couldn't use that word. You know, put uh, more of that thing up again, will you? Thanks. Beyond Cold, it's so confusing that, da 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 and then they fill in the blanks. Uh, the entire nation is talking about the chill. It seems like um, like 180 million people in this country are affected by this Arctic inverted vortex. Is that what they call it? Polar the polar vortex. You know this. Now I, I only got a D in meteorology, so in high school I had the track coach didn't like the way I was running. I've explained that to you before. I got all the concepts. I just didn't test well. He didn't like me. But anyway, this thing that usually sits in Canada like this is now sitting like this. Now, it's, in, it's cold. It's just cold. And in the Midwest, they are suffering dangerously. And you get reporters doing things like this. This is what they do on TV now. They throw water into the air, which immediately becomes kind of an ice bubble. And then bananas can be used as effectively as hammers. I don't know where Jess finds this stuff, to be honest with you. But uh, look at it. See, the banana is hammering the nail into the piece of wood. And the new version of the wet t-shirt contest is you soak the shirt and it becomes a lethal weapon. Look at that. I mean, you want to talk about, I mean, there's pressing a shirt and then there's pressing a shirt. I mean, this is what they're doing to entertain themselves in the Midwest. We just have this one more snap type of thing. You know, today was 13 degrees. It wakes you up in the morning, but it's not nearly as dangerous as they've had in the, in the Midwest. And as they're writing about it, um, USA Today on that headline, you know, it's so cold that an escaped prisoner in Kentucky turned himself in to escape the cold air. More video for you, by the way. That's North Dakota. I had icicles like that on my car this weekend. I did. Uh, Chicago residents, uh, the resident polar bear at the Lincoln Park Zoo stayed indoors. So even polar bears don't want to deal with this. In Minnesota, the record for AAA roadside assistant calls were shattered with 3,000 members calling on Monday alone. And more than 500 Amtrak passengers spent the night on three stop trains headed to Chicago because of blowing and drifting snow in northern central Illinois. Yes, Virginia, there will be a spring, but it feels like a long way away. I heard the Almanac people today talking, and they were saying that they had predicted this and that it's going to be this cold a lot of the time all of this winter. Don't forget that Super Bowl is a giant stadium this year. What a mistake that might end up being. All right, let's get to uh, what's happening here 
at home. First day of government, first day of government here for the state of Rhode Island and the General Assembly gets into business. And it was funny because I was reading Ted Nisi's work uh, today, Nisi's Notes, uh, WPRI.com, you know Ted Nisi, world famous. Uh, Rhode Island lawmakers may get deja vu once the session starts today. What he was saying, and it's a must read, Ted's a must read all the time, but it, the must read I thought was important because he was kicking up some of the issues we discussed on the rundown last night, you know, about what's happening, pension reform and, uh, you know, 38 studios and whether to pay and uh, all that kind of stuff. Nothing really dramatic, no real major economic moves. And he said something very powerful, subtle but powerful. Sometimes subtlety is very powerful. He writes in his column, Governor Lincoln Chafee, an independent turned Democrat who isn't seeking re-election after a rocky three years at the helm, will introduce his proposed budget, da, 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 da. But then Ted writes this, but lawmakers often ignore the governor's ideas. And, and, and I'm sure that Ted wrote that for a purpose, obviously, but I'm not even sure he understands how powerful that was. I think he does because I saw him in the hallway and he gets it. And, and he, he was happy that I got what he was getting and what he was trying to say. And that is, it's an awful tough year when you've got a governor who everybody just kind of goes over. That's not good. It's not good. On the other hand, his ideas have been so bad that maybe it is good. It leaves us in a real quandary. And I don't think we're going to make a lot of progress in 2014 in changing our last place multiple dynamic. I guess we're waiting for an election to do that. Meanwhile, at the General Assembly, there is a lot of conversation about poverty. And Ed Fitzpatrick wrote this column. Uh, I, I'm a fan of Ed's, A, because he's a perfect gentleman, B, he's a, he's a good observer, and C, he writes well. Um, he's not out to hurt anybody in his columns, that's for sure, but uh, he, he makes some reflections. And he talks about this poverty thing in his column. And I, I, in essence, what he's saying is that the the Rhode Island Council of Churches and the other, uh, the other folks who, who make up the Interfaith Coalition are having a vigil tomorrow where they name each individual legislator and then list their agenda to help the poor and all of that. And I had Reverend Donald Anderson, who's mentioned in the column, on the radio today on WPRO on my radio show, which is on noon to three. And I asked him, you know, you know whose job is it to fix this whole thing? And so we need to look at the hard data and say, where are the issues? What are the things that are keeping people in, in deep poverty? And what are the ways in which the various segments of society can work together uh, to help people find a way out of that? Uh, the Reverend will come on the program in the next week or so to kind of elaborate on this. It sounds like the same old kind of rhetoric. Even LBJ, LBJ, LBJ's uh, 50th anniversary uh, celebration, which is this week, the War on Poverty speech that's so famous, a lot of the themes are still resonating. Maybe we've got so many government programs trying to get the job done and we've created a whole culture of poverty, kind of a corporate poverty environment. Have you thought about that? Ed, at the end of his column, wrote something interesting, though. It really grabbed me. But 50 years after the speech, we must find common ground to pull our fellow citizens out of poverty. Respectfully, I ask the question, whose job is it to pull whoever out of poverty? Is it our job to pull those who are in poverty out or their job to pull themselves out? Maybe it's more gray area. Maybe we ought to create an environment where poverty doesn't flourish so much. Maybe we need some economic stimulation in this state and stop trying to solve the problems by throwing money at programs to help the poor inevitably stay poor. Just a thought. And finally, I thought Auburn would win and with a minute 19 to go, I thought I'd made a great prediction. And so the folks in Alabama who are Auburn fans thought that they had pulled it off too. There they are. But this Florida State team was tenacious, hung in there, and no one's talking about this play. With a minute 19 to go, this kid breaks those tackles. Those two defenders miss that tackle. He goes 80 yards and then Jameis Winston finishes it off in, in classic comeback quarterback style. And this 20-year-old freshman who's had a lot of controversy uh, had much to say about what it's like to be a clutch quarterback when it was over. I was, I was ready. 
I wanted to be in that situation because that's what great quarterbacks do. That's what the Tom Brady's, Clay Manning's, Drew Brees, Cam Newton, so that's what they do. I mean, any quarterback can go out there and perform when he's up 50 to nothing in the second quarter. I mean, that's that's what you're judged by, especially about your teammates. I'm, I'm pretty sure I, I got more respect for my teammates and the people around me on that last drive than I got the whole year. Colorful kid. It really is. Hell of a ball game. A classic. Next year, they go to the playoff system. So no more of this random picking of one and two for the final bowl. When we come back, Ken Block will be here. He's filed a complaint, a serious one, and it follows up in this whole story from last night. Don't go anywhere. The statistics say that somewhere between 19 and 27 percent of the folks that are served by this office that are on parole or probation um, are there for a violent offense. And the statistics say that 61 percent of those folks are going to commit another offense. So if anything, uh, I just am concerned about the safety of my employees and making sure that we locate the, this office in a, an appropriate location. For the sake, just to be clear, I don't think it should be on Prairie Avenue either. Mm -hmm. That's a residential neighborhood. So that was some of the conversation last night with uh, CEO of Swipely, uh, Angus Davis, a prominent uh, young man in downtown Providence based on his business success. He, the Chamber of Commerce, the Rhode Island Foundation, and others were pretty uh, upset about the state's decision uh, to move the probation and parole operation from Prairie Street in the south end of Providence to downtown at 40 Fountain Street. We have a picture. We do. Don't we have a picture uh, somewhere? Are we calling for that at some point? There we go. Thank you, Laura. Um, that's an architectural drawing of the very building that has, uh, that was proposed for a first floor operation for this. And then uh, last night, guess what? Uh, a decision was made that created this headline today. Uh, state backs off the probation office site. Clearly, it was the Dan York State of Mind program last night that changed the direction of this entire thing. Uh, well, you know what? You can never tell. But uh, this guy might have had something to do with it, too, because he was... Uh, his uh, limited hair was on fire. Oh, that's awful. Man. You know what? Isn't that terrible? We, like, we I can't throw any, the flag. Like, after, like, uh, anything I, like, I have anything to say. I mean, I'm catching well, up to you, to be honest uh, with you. you got a little ways to go. Happy New anyway. Year. Happy New Year to you. Here. Ken Block is here, the uh, candidate for governor, now a Republican. We've covered a lot of that in the past, so you'll have to catch up on the politics. But you issued a press release yesterday on this particular matter in part seems to me because Correct. the 40 Fountain Street story has been catalytic to paying attention to this State Buildings Commission uh, but you issued a press release saying you're gonna have a press conference today and it wasn't soon after that the administration actually reversed their their course now, Correct. I can't say that it was you or Angus Davis on my program but the collective surge of what on this had Richard Leeds the director of administration and the governor I guess taking pause right right when you shine the light of scrutiny on deals like this. If the deals are not being done in the open in the first place, oftentimes you'll find that the people doing these deals go, wait a minute, wait a minute maybe, maybe we have to reconsider. I think that's what happened here. Uh, the the no-bid aspect of this deal, the fact that this deal was happening uh, without public members on the committee, uh, the fact that this committee doesn't document its proceedings in terms of filing its required minutes, all those things added up and the reality is they had to back off and they had to do it the right way. All right, so last night we covered a lot of this story and of course all of our shows are online if you miss them. We originate at 7.30, 11.30 we repeat, but you can go to foxprovincecom slash MeyerITV and catch up on anything that you might have missed, so uh, you're required to do that. Uh, the, uh, the story that Angus was telling the last night is very much about that, the process of the meetings and the like. Tell me where you, the Republican gubernatorial candidate, fell into an interest in this particular conversation. So I was made aware of, uh, through, through the uh, media and through uh, talking to Angus, about the particulars of the w style and the manner in which this deal was coming up. And uh, I'm no stranger to looking into open meetings violations and that sort of thing. And uh, this week, this past weekend, I decided to look and see what was the lead up to the decision for the no bid aspect of this contract. And what I learned very quickly was that there were all kinds of meeting minutes missing going back through time. So I couldn't do the research needed that I needed to do as a member of the public to understand why we found ourselves in the situation where we had to have a no bid contract. There needs to be documentation. You need to have a lead up to the decision to say, wait a minute, we're going to do this without going out to bid. Because you and I both know when you go out to bid, 
you get the best results in terms of competitive pricing. So when that decision was made not to go out to bid, and I couldn't find what well, the reason was. Well, as I understand, it was, was a bid originally, and only the Urban League responded to it. Where that's the Prairie Street location, by the way. But the Urban right. League is looking to sell their building because they're in financial distress, and so they've got an option out of that building somehow. It seems to me. So for some reason, there was a bid process that the Urban League was the, the loan responder to. When that didn't work out, they did boom go to this new option, which did not have a bid process. So they didn't rebid it. Is that that's my that's understanding. correct? And, and okay. if they only had one bid. That leaves you with zero. You go out to rebid. Rebid. And that is the right thing to do. And they use some executive privilege to do so, correct? A and as I understand the process, uh, Richard Leach, uh, who is the, the director of administration for the state, gave Richard Leach, uh, member of the commission, the committee, the buildings, building properties committee, permission to do this without uh, in a no bid way. So there wasn't any real vetting in the public eye of reasoning and rationale for doing this. There was no discussion of it, and you had one individual giving permission to the same individual in different capacities okay. to put the bid out. All right, so what Ken did today, if I understand, is you filed some complaints. Yes. And when we come back, we'll talk about exactly what the complaints are, who they target, and what the results are that we can expect. Stay with us. Welcome back in. Ken Black is my guest. He's a candidate for governor, but, uh, you know, th that obviously needs to be kept in perspective, but there's nothing about this story that we're talking about today that is necessarily political. Um, then again, everything public is political. doesn't mean it's necessarily nefarious. Although this process the state administration, the chief administration, has used to pick this building, the parole location that they intended, which was 40 Fountain Street, thank you, Laura, that picture right there shows, and now they've reversed their position on it uh, based on a hue and cry from the public, goes right to what you're upset about, and that is that there, had, there wasn't the open kind of public process to actually create the kind of arguments that Angus Davis proposed last night here on this show and that you're proposing. So now they have to unwind a deal that they did in order to save face, and that's backwards. Well, it's backwards, but even more importantly, there's been a violation of the public trust here in the way that this commission, committee, has conducted its business. Explain what this commission is. So it's, it's, it, it's supposed it's to be a, a broader it is, thing. It is a, composed of five members, two from the public who do not exist, uh, two from the Department of Administration. Meaning they're vacant. They're vacant, and one from uh, Attorney General Kilmartin's office. Those are all the voting members, and the general treasurer has a non-voting seat. Uh, so how many committee. are actually sitting on the active committee right so, now? So five votes, one observer. And now there's only three official... Uh, Does Kilmartin have a rep on it? Commission, Kilmartin has yeah. a rep on it. All right. Long story short, they made this decision to take this very, very important facility in a down city. It got, it got waylaid by public response. Gosh knows where they're going to be right now. Uh, it really is a little nutty. And so you filed today, you announced today that you were filing legitimate public criminal complaints Correct. against who? It's against the committee uh, for violating the open meetings uh, law for the uh, timely reporting of meeting minutes. And they violated this multiple times. Going back in time, they roughly get about half of their meetings recorded, which is really a bad, it's awful. Mm. Because these, this committee is essentially the landlord and the real estate agent for the state of Rhode Island. They do a lot of deals worth a lot of money hmm. with a lot of insider type people and they're not telling us how they conduct their business and how they reach their decisions. So do you expect these people to pay fines? The, uh, if this law is enforced aggressively, the Attorney General has the, uh, the duty to do this. The Attorney General and has a member on the committee. He has a member on the committee. So the, the General Treasurer has representation on this committee. The Attorney General has representation on this committee. Governor Chafee has substantial representation on this committee. None of those state office holders has cared enough about this committee to ensure that the public's interest is represented with the public seats on this committee. And this committee has been butchering our open meetings laws left and right. The, the, in my opinion, the governor should yank everyone off that committee that he can and replace them right away. If I was governor, I would be taking stronger action 
against any of my state employees who are engaged in this kind of butchering well, of state law. It's going to be interesting to see what Peter Kilmartin, the Attorney General, who is the most uh, persona non grata state official or law enforcement official I've ever seen in Rhode Island history, uh, he's going to have to respond in a couple of ways. A, formally to your complaint, and B, respond to his role constitutionally and his appointee on that particular committee and, and resolve all that. Look, is, it, is, is that the right that, office to be able to handle this? Yeah, uh, we need to hope so because that is where the power is vested to do this. Look, everyone's upset about 38 Studios. Mm. 38 Studios happened behind the curtains, right? The right. deal was done behind the curtains, no one saw it, and then it showed up. Rhode Islanders have every right to know what our government is doing before it happens as opposed to after it happens. That is not the way that this committee was operating, and it's wrong. And if we don't like 38 Studios, if we want to stop the reputation that we have of being the who do you know state, we have to start operating our government in a much more open and transparent way. And you start by following the laws that we have, and when, when our public officials don't follow their own laws, we have to take strong action to ensure that they do. Well, I think that's a pretty good executive summary, and I'm out of time. Wish I had time to talk politics with him, but this guy Napolitano, who's coming over his side, is joining me tomorrow. We're having a little run on the Dan York Show. This is not a setup. It's just the way the news seems to fall. Happy New Year, man. We'll Happy see, New we'll, Year. We'll see how the AG responds, and we'll pursue the answers. Your state of mind when we come back. Stay with us. We always want to know what your state of mind is. By the way, it's Prairie Avenue, not Prairie Street. I made that mistake a couple of times this week. Uh, anyway, uh, for the full screen, <laughs> your state of mind, 228-1886. You leave me a voicemail. Of course, email me at stateofmindamiritv.com. And when you leave voicemails, we play them, like this gentleman's. He's living in another world, him and the former mayor who ruined the city of Providence. Michael Solomon will be the next mayor because the guy did a tremendous job. Uh, that was in response to Joe the Barber's holiday trip here where he said that Buddy Sands would be the next mayor. I have no idea what that election is going to look like, but I love a guy who's got a candidate, Joe Solomon, right? All right, we'll see you tomorrow, 730 on Meyer Right TV. Good night.